Over the last several years as president and CEO of Ford Motor Company, I've had to deal with a lot of high pressure situations. From board meetings, to meeting presidents from countries all over the globe, to even racing at Le Mans in a GT40 in the rain at 200 miles an hour in the dark. And after all that, what really freaks me out is looking down the lens of someone's iPhone and having to record something for our social media team at Ford, which is why I have a lot to learn from our next guest. Take a listen and you'll hear exactly what I'm talking about. What is up guys? Right behind me is the Ford Bronco Raptor and I wanna know if you would choose this over a Jeep Wrangler. So in the rear, you have your coil set up, your three inch live valve Fox shocks, you have your factory bump stops and your trailing arm. The Raptor also gets a roll bar right here and an additional one right there. Under the hood, you have a three liter twin turbo V6, it makes 418 horsepower and it sounds pretty good. <laughs> Forrest Jones is a social media influencer and a car reviewer. He has millions of followers on TikTok and YouTube, including me. And yes, I even learned a lot of new things about the Raptor, like its shock absorbers from Fox. How cool was that? This is Drive, and I'm Jim Farley. First of all, your Raptor video was like super high energy. It was like, oh my God, um, in my job, I need to have that kind of energy. So I, I, you're contagious, by the way. I just wanted to say that. So um, what, is, what does it mean to be an influencer? That's a good question. I didn't go into this wanting to be an influencer, really. Um, I actually went into this wanting to be more of like the super in-depth 20 to 30 minute video car reviewer that, has, that had like extremely good knowledge to offer which I did do on YouTube for, I think, about three to four years. Then once I transitioned to TikTok, I realized I have more of a knack for that. I mean, the word influencer definitely does carry weight. There's, there's people that will comment and message me and say, I won't buy a car until you make a video on it. And so because I don't have a lot of time in these videos, I don't really have time, like I said, to give my, my like full in-depth opinion. I do have opinions on every car that I film. Um, it's going to sound bad to say, but there's really no such thing as like a professional anymore. Everyone can Google things and there's the internet. And so everyone thinks that they know better and you're never going to have information that someone else can't access. And I'm going to let the people decide whether or not they like it because they're probably all over the forums. They're probably all over the internet. So I think with being an influencer, I'm sort of like the gateway for people who aren't necessarily into cars. And then through my videos, I could probably create people who start to get into cars and then they start to funnel down the road of becoming like a legit car enthusiast because they started watching my videos and then now they're watching like more in-depth tuning videos or something like I see. that, you know? Well, I got to tell you, you're an amazing driver when I saw the donuts you did in the, in the Raptor. That was, that was like some, Sorry that's that. pretty skillful. No, no, that's why we designed the car. We designed the car for people like yeah. you to do that. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's cool. And so what do you drive now? I have to ask, cause I'm sure everyone wants to know. Everyone does want to know. And they're always so disappointed because we don't own a car right now. Okay. <laughs> what gets you excited out in the marketplace? I mean, for you personally. I am a big truck guy. I'm from Texas originally. And I promise I'm not saying this because you're yeah. on here, but I'm definitely, I wouldn't say like I'm a biased Ford fan. I do like Ford because my family has had Ford. My mom had a focus that got to like 300 and like 30,000 miles. And the only reason she got rid of it is because she got T-boned. Um, my dad does like farm work. So he hauls a bunch of like hay cattle. I got it. And so he has an F-350 dually. Love your dad. Thank you, dad. <laughs> yeah, this is the second one. The first one he got rid of because it hit like 500,000 miles. And then I've always wanted a Raptor. Once the Raptor R came out, I thought that was pretty cool. If I were to get like a car like like an easy to maintain i think i'd probably actually go electric you would to be honest all right i would um just because they're they're easy maintenance yeah. not as much brake maintenance um especially out here in southern california it's definitely cheaper to charge than to fuel up a raptor r yeah <laughs> good point you may find it interesting where the raptor came from it's a totally like a lot of times in the car business the best cars come from like skunk works so it was a skunk works project um, I came from Toyota and we used to race at Baja. Um, and for 
we found a market with the Tacoma called the pre-runner market, which was a two wheel drive vehicle mm -hmm. that had much lower insurance and four wheel drive, but it was lifted, had really good suspension and it had four doors. So people could carry like their family, but it was a pre-runner and that's what the uh, Ivan Stewart and people like that raced at Baja. And when they did their trials at Baja, they'd, they'd bring a pre-runner and put like American V8 in a Tacoma uh, but it was two wheel drive um because that's what they raced and and when i got to the company i'm like well, why doesn't ford have a a pre-runner and they're like well, what's that <clears throat> the engineering team had no idea what a pre-runner is i said um well you know this is what it should be blah 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 and we have great v8s so why don't we take the highest performance v8 put an f-150 but develop as a real world drive truck with really good um suspension technology much better than we have and they're like, well, I don't know, would that sell? I was like, I think we could sell a couple thousand. And they said, well, how do we build a prototype? I said, why don't we just build a prototype and have our engineers go race a Baja 1000 as a, like a, as a vacation. So we gave them $6 million. They went to Fox and they cobbled together a prototype. Um, and the whole thing cost $6 million to put together, including the engineering for, for all the suspension. And they did that and they came back and they're like, that was really fun. People really liked it. We should build it. And the first volume call was a thousand vehicles. <laughs> and I, I think we were pretty wrong. Um, so tell me about the first thing you look for in a car. So from a work perspective, I think the thing I focus on mostly is what the car is built to do. So what the goal of that specific car is. So like if I'm a big sports car fan, can't go into something like an F-150 with the mindset of, oh, this isn't sporty at all. So I have to go into it with the mindset of, okay, this is a truck, here's a target audience. What is this truck built to do? What segment does this fit in? And if it performs that really well, then in my opinion, it's a good car. Totally get it. So there's a trend in the car industry that I saw a couple of years ago where people were, taking supercars or high performance on-road cars and lifting them slightly, putting suspension technology so that they could go off-road, like the new 911 Perry Dakar version. Yes, I believe that there is such a thing as a off-road supercar that is not a Bronco Raptor or a truck. And I think it will look really different. Do you think there'd be a market for that? Like a two to three hundred thousand dollars supercar that can go on road as good as a supercar and off road as good as a, a Raptor R? I guess it depends on your market. And I feel like that's an extremely uh, narrowed in demographic. So for example, American market, we have lots of trucks and lots of Jeeps, lots of trails that have big rocks and like you know, of course, most places have that. But let's say if you went to somewhere like Australia, who has a lot of more like flat dirt and you can really just like kind of go fast. I mean, of course, we have dunes and stuff out in out in California, which is like where Dakar and Storado would probably shine a lot. But there's not a lot of those places around the U.S. So I think with something like Jeep, Bronco Raptor, F-150 Raptor, you can use those in more places, whereas the supercars, A, that's already a narrow demographic and then B having someone that's actually willing to get it dirty is another narrow demographic within that. Um, so do I think there's a market for it? I do, but in very limited quantities to very specific people. So like 500 to a thousand units or something like that, super narrow, something that's going to really keep its value and not like be mass production. Totally. So uh, I find what you do really fascinating because, you know, I've tried to learn about social media for my job just to tell people what's going on at Ford. And personally, I'm like you, I just love cars. So I love being around car people like you. And what advice would you give me if I wanted to kind of, or anyone who's listening to take their, what they're interested in and make content on YouTube and TikTok? My best advice is just to start, even if it's low quality, my first video on YouTube was low quality. I was broke at the time, so I had like Virgin Mobile. So you can imagine the video quality coming off of that phone. Um, <laughs> even on TikTok, I, 
it was all shot on my iPhone. I didn't have a format really. You kind of just develop those things as you go. So it's basically get your feet wet, get in there, post something. Um, and then from there, just keep trying things until you find something that works. Once you find that groove that works, stick with it, but don't ever be afraid to try something new, even when you do have like your groove. Because uh, getting stuck in a rut is never, never a good thing. Even with what I do, I always try to switch it up. So I've been trying to film like, I've been filming strollers recently as like All right. car reviews. We got to go in the stroller thing. <laughs> you, you totally got me there. So I I have three kids that are pretty close in age. So at one point we had like one of those double strollers. But but now I look at parents because that was like, you know, 10 years ago or longer. Strollers have evolved a lot. So tell me what you look for in a stroller and why did you decide to do a stroller review as a like one of the biggest car influencers in the industry. Yeah. Okay. So let's start with why I did it. My son can't drive, but he has a vehicle of sorts that keeps him safe, that has features, and that's a stroller. And it's got wheels and it rides and drives in some form or fashion. So I was like, let's do it. The one I currently use a lot is a Nuna, <laughs> Nuna stroller. And sometimes it's the simplicity that makes things better when it comes to, to strollers mm. because you want it to be light, especially if my wife has to handle it and she pulled it up light, easy to put in and out. And then he just snaps right into the stroller and then we just go. So what you're saying is the strollers these days are integrated to car seats. You know, 10 years ago, my wife and I, we would have to buy a car seat and then you'd have to buy a stroller and they uh -huh. weren't integrated. They were like two separate things, but they should have been because you're almost yep. always taking the child out of the child seat and putting them in a stroller. It makes total sense mm -hmm. to me that it's completely integrated. That's a good design. So um, you talked a little bit about EVs already, and I'm, I'm really curious about your view because I think it will be, for a lot of the listeners, be a bit different than what they hear from people trying to you know sell EVs, like a Ford or a Tesla or whatever. Uh, you've done some reviews on EVs. I'm curious how the evolution of electric vehicles is changing your love of cars. I, <laughs> I love EVs. I love them. Um, so I guess when I call myself a car enthusiast, I'm not necessarily just enthusiastic about like anything with like a big block V8 loud exhaust manual transmission and rear wheel drive, which, which are great things. But like, I guess in terms of car enthusiasts, I just get really enthusiastic about cars in general, as long as if there's something new and there's something different in like, I was born in 92. So most of my growing up was like when the tech stuff started, all the cartoons had like flying cars or some sort of cars with different types of propulsion. And so now that there's electric cars and there's all this new tech, it's different, it's exciting. And EVs don't, of course, have the same characteristics as gas, which they shouldn't because they're just completely different sources of energy. I think there's going to come a point where electric is going to have like an enthusiast market like gas does. It's just not going to look like what it looks like with, with gas. When Ford made Model T, I'm sure people with horses were like, were like oh, I can't connect with this like I can with my horse. Like, I don't know what they said back then, but I can only assume that the market for people who like maybe bartered, traded horses was not very happy about this new thing coming in. That'll be different. And then even you think of the first gas car, you had to like crank it up from the front and do all this like mess. And now we're at a point to where you have things like a GT500, GT350R, Ford GT, Bronco Raptor, Ford Raptor. So... I think it's just going to take the right person that looks at an EV and says, you know what, why hasn't anyone done this yet? I just don't think it's happened yet. In 1910, the auto market was one third internal combustion, mm -hmm. one third steam and one third electric. That's insane. That's how it was. And there were more than a thousand companies. That's crazy. Um, that. So like we're there again. Mm -hmm. For me as the CEO of Ford, I'm really excited because I'm a car person like you, but I'm really excited about the tech revolution, not just the propulsion revolution. And I wanted to ask you a question about that. 
just like the iPhone or the smartphones in the mid 2000s, when we realized, you know, content like music, doing email on your phone were like the first software that got shipped to the phone where you stopped using it to make calls and started using it for something else. I think we now understand the first shippable software to the car. It's safety and security, so video content, you know, using your car like your home as a safety and security item, checking for your mm -hmm. tools in the back. Uh, if someone tries to steal, you know, your car or something in it. The second one is productivity. So for like your dad, you know, we can now um, ship prognostics to the vehicle so we can predict failure of all components in the vehicle. And if your dad likes his super duty, you know, he'll love knowing that something wrong is gonna happen before it happens. And we have a lot of other productivity like telematics, driver coaching. We can now limit the speed of a car if you own a fleet. And the third one is partial autonomy, you know, hands off and then eventually eyes off on a sunny day in Southern California. Do you think software can differentiate a car? Or do you think it's still gonna be the hardware that differentiates cars for customers? Well, if you're talking software, at one point, it's going to be both. So for example, I'll start with Polestar. So I actually have one that I'm filming right now. And I think they have probably like second or third best software in a car. It's just really simple. It's like the Google Android powered one. It is. And Volvo shares some of the same stuff as well. But the Polestar does it best, in my opinion, because the Google Assistant can control lots of actual functions in the car, like rolling up your windows switching you into a different mode. Um, and then the most important thing for me is because it's a touchscreen, the widgets that I have to touch to like get into a menu, they're very, very large. Like it looks like four big squares. And then as you hit things, it goes into a new screen, but everything's very big. So I think because I review so many cars, I always think about the things that I miss. Like if I were to build my own car from all the cars I reviewed, and if I were to take my favorite aspects of each car, those are software aspects I would have. Quick response, good refresh rate. Refresh rate is huge. Like on my iPhone, I'm doing things and everything's moving around so quick. There's no latency, there's no delay. That's a big, big deal for most people around my age. Like I'm 30, especially if you're younger. Uh-oh. I hear my son. Dad, what's your son's name? This is Phoenix. Hey, Phoenix. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> yeah, he's, well, he's totally fine as long as I'm holding him. <laughs> That's cute. That's awesome. This is the first time it's happened to me uh, <laughs> during my podcast. So that I, I love first things. You give a guest star. Uh, yeah. Thank you, <laughs> Phoenix, for being my first superstar guest. Uh, so I'd like to learn more from you about wh what is the one question you think every new car owner should be asking? This is actually a perfect question because before I got into all this, I used to actually sell cars for Ford. <laughs> it was a Ford and Mazda dealership. Oh, really? Okay. So I kind of used what I learned there, mix it with what I do now in terms of explaining the things I feel like people care the most about. So I feel like if you're looking at a new car, the questions you should ask yourself is not necessarily like, is this the best car, but is this the best car for me? Um, because everyone has like very specific scenarios. So, so like I'm married, I have a kid. Uh, so my priorities are very different. I need something with space, but I also like something that's fun. So I need something that's fun in whatever way. Maybe it's like off-road, maybe it's performance. I want it to look good. Uh, I want it to be a little bit nicer. But if I were single by myself, honestly, and if I had the money, I'd probably be the demographic looking at like Storado or like the car, just something crazy, fun, unique, that's cool and different. Uh, so I guess the question I would have, it's pretty obvious is, what do you think the future dealerships are? Having sold cars and having lived in Texas, I have to add that because hospitality in Texas is like ingrained in me and I waited tables. So my level okay. of hospitality, I like to think is really high. I think the future of cars, I love the model that Tesla Rivian does where you can just buy it. However, it's like buying stuff off of Amazon versus going into a store. There's always something about going into a store and let's be honest, if you're buying like a really nice car, like some people like to like just flex on other people just to be like, yeah, I'm buying this. And I think when you have a, a dealership or like a store, you can sort of like engage in that um, as, as very uh, superficial as it sounds. However, it's, it's true. And it's something that's it's like getting a front uh -huh. parking spot when you have a real nice car. So I think the future dealerships would be 
similar to like an Apple store, but obviously everything would sort of be done on the computer. There wouldn't be any like back and forth haggling necessarily. I think it would be set prices and that'd be it. It'd be almost like a gallery. You can totally. go in, you can test stuff. And I don't see why you couldn't have a few vehicles on the lot. I don't see why you couldn't have a few vehicles there. But I think the set pricing structure is kind of a big deal. I uh, was the first president of Scion and we, we didn't have non-negotiated price and uh, people loved it. Awesome. And uh, yeah, that was my first breakout job really is to run Scion. Mm -hmm. And uh, now with Model E, uh, in January next year, we're going to launch non-negotiated price because we think it not only saves a lot of time, but everyone feels like, you know, and, and it can be done, like you said. I, I think that's, I'm totally with you. Um, I have to ask you two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I asked most of my guests this. If you had one day where you could run Ford, mm -hmm. what would you spend your day doing? And then the second question is, do you have any advice for me as a CEO of Ford? I think I'd probably work on future products because, you know, with everything, with everything going hybrid electric or just everything going more advanced or in the tech direction, I think one thing I would focus on is, is the tech. This is coming from obviously the most respectful place, but mm -hmm. I haven't driven the new Mustang though, because I've heard the, the screen and the tech and the new Mustang is incredible. But um, that's the only issue I've really had with some Ford products like Explore, Escape, is the tech just always feels a little bit like mm -hmm. too dated or too laggy latency for me. And it's just always, for me, makes it feel like immediately older in a sense. That's one thing I would focus on. Did you evaluate, did you evaluate uh, the new Blue Cruise at 1.2 or our uh, updated uh, HMI for the Mustang Mach-E? Because we just did a massive over-the-air update using all the data off the vehicle for uh, the interior software for a Mustang Mach. -E. I'll have to get back in Mach -E. Last time I was in it was, I believe, two years ago. What are you doing? Oh yeah, you got it. Yeah, I'd be very interested in both Phoenix and your feedback. And then any advice or any question you have for the CEO of Ford or any advice, I'm here for you. Yeah, I mean, keep the Mustang stuff coming. Uh, the okay, this is great. I, I think the support recipe with, with Dodge. And I just went to the unveiling for the Demon 130 or 170. I can't remember. The, I can't remember the number because what Dodge does like has a lot of crazy behind it. So when they came out with the 700 horsepower, it's like okay, let's be honest, your platform can't really handle 700 horsepower. But because of that level of like crazy insanity, I feel like that attracts people who are a little bit on the like edgy side. You know, you just All it's right. just different. Customer. So we need more crazy. We need more crazy in Mustang. We, I mean, obviously within within yeah. limits and obviously doing it the Ford way, whatever Ford would consider something like crazy. But I think like the last time I remember Ford making something that I thought was like, dude, that's crazy. The first time the Raptor came out, oh my gosh, people are like, that's nuts. When GT 350R came out, I was like, what in the world? That was yes, insane with a to me. Flat plane crank um, motor, mm -hmm. 8,000 yeah. plus RPM. Yeah. And, and basically the, the same, the same sort of like energy or spirit that was whenever the, um, I believe, was it the 20, uh -huh. 2012, 2013? It was, it was crazy. Mustang, the Shelby GT500, when it had like, was it like 600? And everyone was like, over the top the world? Okay. Yeah. That, I think that same like level of like marketing over the top, people, people love it. But like you said, wanting to take on like Porsche and all them. So still doing that level of crazy, but then maybe you could direct it towards what would be crazy in terms of like a performance track car, something no one would have ever expected to see on a Mustang. So maybe, maybe that's the direction you can go if you didn't necessarily want to copy the whole Dodge throwing a thousand horsepower at it. Type all right. Thing, you know? well, I'll go back to work. Uh, I got it. <laughs> I appreciate the, uh, I appreciate the advice. Uh, Forrest, it's so nice to get to know you. I've, I've watched your videos. I respect what you do. Uh, I can't wait to see what you do next, man. Strollers, uh, supercars. It's all interesting. Well, I got to put it out there. I, I still need to film the dark horse. So <laughs> that would be a good video. I think, I think you'll like it. And, and hopefully you'll bring uh, Phoenix too. Oh yeah, for sure. Nice to meet you. Bye-bye. Bye, Forrest. Bye, Phoenix. Bye, sir. Have a good day. Say bye, Bob. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> 
Drive is produced by Jesse Baker and Eric Newsom of Magnificent Noise. Our production staff includes Julia Natt, Eva Walchover, and Kristen Muller, with help from Lori Arpin, Krista Gentile, Max Owen Dunell, Catherine Sanders, Darnell Macon, and Mark Truby. Our host is Jim Farley, and this is Drive.